Thank you, Rob, and thank you all for turning out on short notice. I turned out on short notice. <laughs> Rob called me a couple of weeks ago and he said, I see you're going to be in Charlotte. You have to come to Raleigh. <laughs> and the, my only regret is that I couldn't be here later in the day because I always love to talk with teachers. Are there any teachers here? All right, thank you. I'm so glad you could be here. I hope you're not missing class. <laughs> Some of you are, yes. Okay, so let me just lay out what I see happening. The first principle that I want to talk about is what do high-performing nations do? It's important to know what best practices are. The first thing is that the best-performing nations in the world have a strong public education system. They do not have vouchers and they do not have charters. They do not have privately managed schools. They have a strong public education system. Secondly, they have a strong education profession. They have highly trained professional teachers. They have principals who are educators and they have superintendents who are educators. They don't bring in military generals, military admirals, social workers, lawyers. They don't have somebody who went to a training program on the West Coast that's uncertified. They have experienced educators throughout their education system. It's a profession. Thirdly, teachers in these high-performing nations are highly respected. They are professionals. Their experience is valued. There is no such thing as teach for Finland. <laughs> there are no amateur teachers in Finland or Japan or Korea. The fourth thing you should know is that they assure that every child in every school has a full curriculum, a curriculum with the arts, with history, with civics, with literature, with geography, <coughs> with foreign languages, with physical education every day. I was very impressed when I visited Finland about how much recess they have because they know the children need to run around and blow off steam and it makes them more attentive when they come back into class. We have schools in this country that are eliminating recess to raise test scores. It's crazy. Now, let's get to North Carolina. North Carolina is not following any of the best practices found in the high-performing nations of the world. Instead, it is encouraging privatization of schools which will not only damage public education, but will hand off students and taxpayer dollars to entrepreneurs, chain schools, and for-profit corporations. North Carolina is dismantling one of the essential institutions of a democratic society. It's a very risky scheme. It has no evidence behind it. The only country that has followed the voucher route, the Milton Friedman route, is Chile. And Chile is now having massive student protests because of the extent of inequality created and reinforced by its vastly unequal school system of privatized education. North Carolina seems determined to destroy the teaching profession and to demoralize every teacher in the state. As some of you may know, I have a blog, uh, it's dianeravich.net. I get huge numbers of letters from teachers in North Carolina, and they all talk about how terrible the environment is as a teacher, how the lack of support from public officials the constant demonization of teachers is being responsible for low test scores and for every negative social condition is somehow caused by teachers. They never knew that they were so powerful as to bring down the whole state. <laughs> North Carolina was once viewed as the most progressive state in the South. It is not anymore. It's a shame. Those days are over. Now North Carolina is viewed, among other things, as being a very hostile environment for public education and for people who teach in public schools. Some of your political leaders look at the public schools as a fiscal burden rather than a public responsibility and, it, and as an engine of social progress, which is the way they should be viewed. I read the other day about the bill introduced by State Senator Berger to give school grades. Now, New York City has been grading schools for several years. This practice of giving school grades was pioneered by Jeb Bush in Florida in 1999. The main thing that grades do to a school is to stigmatize it. It does nothing to improve schools. It says, this is a bad school, everyone in it must be bad, and it makes teachers feel bad, it makes the school bad, it does nothing for school improvement. Uh, I, I live in Brooklyn, New York City, and in my neighborhood school is a really good school. Uh, it's a school that for a long time was not considered a good school because it was filled with kids only from housing projects. And a new dynamic principal came in and was able to attract kids in the nearby non-housing projects. And so now it's filled with kids from both housing projects and from the neighborhood. 
and it's a wonderful school, and it got an A on its report card. And the mayor and the chancellor came to visit and say, this is a great school, we're going to build an addition. But six weeks later, the grades came out, and the school went from an A to an F. And I went to see the principal, and I said, what happened? And he said, I have no idea. We have the same staff, the same program, the same curriculum, the same kids. Nothing changed, and we went from an A to an F. I have no idea. It is totally arbitrary. It's got it's some complex algorithm in which you have to be a statistician to understand how in the world they're grading your school. Uh, the main thing that the grades are used for is to set schools up for closure. If you get two Fs in a row or two Ds in a row or sometimes even two Cs in a row, you're finished. They're going to close your school and put a charter school in your building. So that's what it's used for. It's, it's the preliminary to the privatizing of your school. It's very demoralizing. The other part of this legislation that was just introduced is to strip teachers of due process rights. This is in K-12 education, with, this is known as tenure, and it's confused with university tenure. In the university, tenure means virtually ironclad protection from ever being fired. Once you get it, you spend your years, you pass, you write, pass, you write a book, you get approved by your colleagues, you have tenure. It's very tough to get rid of a tenured professor. It's almost impossible. That is not what teachers in K through 12 have. What tenure means in K through 12 is give due process. If someone wants to fire you, they have to have a reason, and they have to be prepared to sit down in front of an independent person and have a hearing. You have a right to a hearing. That's all. So without tenure, that means that there will be parts of this country, parts of the state, where teachers will be afraid to mention the word evolution because they might be fired. They'll be afraid to teach Huckleberry Finn. They'll be afraid to teach global warming. They'll be afraid to teach anything controversial because their job hangs in the balance. And the balance is don't make parents angry. Uh, if, they're, if they get a new principal and the principal is a devotee of phonics or whole language and they're not, they may be fired for that. Maybe the principal doesn't like the way they part their hair. Maybe the principal has religious issues. They'll be fired. That's why we have tenure, to protect academic freedom. Teachers will not have academic freedom if they don't even have the right to have a hearing and due process when someone wants to fire them. <clears throat> of course, incompetent teachers should be fired. Of course, there should be evaluation. But evaluation, but removing due process is ridiculous. What message is Senator Berger sending? His message is, North Carolina does not want career teachers. North Carolina does not want teachers with master's degrees. North Carolina doesn't care about who is teaching your children as long as they're willing to drill them incessantly to get higher test scores. North Carolina doesn't want standards for teachers. It wants anybody to come in who can get the scores regardless of how they were prepared. The bottom line is North Carolina does not respect teachers and does not care to have a teaching profession. So you're evaluating teachers in the state because you had the misfortune of winning a race to the top grant. <laughs> and Race to the Top is a program that has not a shred of evidence behind any of its mandates. Arnie Duncan likes everything about Race to the Top because you see Chicago is a model for the nation. <laughs> Unless you know anything about the Chicago schools, which just announced this morning that they're closing 50 more elementary schools, the biggest mass school closure in American history. Uh, but Chicago's a funny city. Everybody who's been the leader there claims to have saved it. They've been saved more times than anybody, who, except I guess people who go to revival meetings once a week. <laughs> so Arnie Duncan said, as part of your race to the top, and lots of other states are doing it, even though they didn't win race to the top, you have to evaluate teachers by the test scores of their students, whether they go up or whether they go down. This is called value-added measurement or value-added assessment. It's known in the profession as VAM, or value-added measurement. And it says that the teacher is almost wholly responsible for whether the scores go up or down. But Arnie Duncan didn't tell you that there is no evidence whatsoever that this will either measure teacher quality or improve education. He didn't tell you, I suspect, that no other nation in the world is doing this. He didn't tell you that when you put that much emphasis on test scores, it encourages teaching to the test, cheating, and narrowing the curriculum, and that your school will probably drop the arts, probably eliminate recess, and probably drop a lot of other things because the test scores are the only thing that counts. And I'm sure he never didn't tell anybody 
that both the National Academy of Education and the American Educational Research Association, two of our august research bodies, issued a joint statement opposing the use of value-added measurement and said that it was wrong, that it's inaccurate, that it's unstable, that it mislabels teachers, that it measures who you're teaching and not your quality as a teacher, that the bad teachers, the so-called bad teachers, are the ones who are teaching English language learners because they're not going to get the big score gains. The bad teachers are the ones who are teaching the kids who have disabilities, especially the most severe disabilities, because they'll hardly get any gains. And the bad teachers are teaching the gifted children. Isn't that amazing? It's because the gifted children are already at the ceiling and they can't go any higher. I, in my grandson's elementary school in Brooklyn, the principal told me about one of the gifted teachers in her building, and she has a very large elementary school. There are 1,400 kids there. It's a very popular school. And she said one of the gifted teachers had a class that came in, and their average score as they entered the class was 3.92. And the top is 4, 4.0. And so the computer said that they had to leave with a 3.97, but when they left, they had a 3.95. So based on that two one-hundredths of a point, she's considered a very bad teacher. And she, if they have layoffs, she'll be first in line to get a pink slip. It's nuts. It's absolutely crazy. The principal says she's a wonderful teacher. She's a great teacher. But the computer doesn't agree. The good teachers, under value-added measurement, are the ones who teach affluent kids. Isn't that wonderful? All the good teachers are migrated out to where the, the affluent kids are. Uh, they, don't, they don't seem to teach the tough cases. So what's going to happen as you use this system is that teachers will start avoiding the kids who will drag their scores down. And is this good for education? No. Is it good for the kids? No. How do we avoid teaching kids who have disabilities? How do we avoid teaching kids who are English language learners? Well, we can just keep firing their teachers every other year. Who will want to teach them? So. The whole idea that behind the senator's plan is that we want to, as he puts it, reward excellence. What he means is performance pay. Uh, he wants to tie teacher pay and teacher increases and bonuses to test scores. This is a really bad idea. It just intensifies narrowing the curriculum, teaching to the test, cheating, etc. And so those who are teaching affluent kids will get a bonus. And those who are teaching the most challenging kids will get no bonus or they'll get fired. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Now, what he calls performance pay is often called merit pay. And the thing you need to know about it, and you have to say this again and again because it's true, is that merit pay has been tried in the United States for almost 100 years. It has never succeeded. It has never worked. It comes and goes. And every once in a while, somebody has this bright idea, let's, let's pay people to get higher test scores. And then after a few years, they dropped the program because it didn't work. It was tried most rigorously and most recently in Nashville at Vanderbilt University, where they decided that the reason that the merit pay hadn't ever worked in the past was because the bonuses were too small. And you need a really big bonus to motivate teachers who we all know are very lazy. <laughs> so instead of having the typical bonus, which is about three to $5,000, the economist at Nashville offered a bonus of $15,000, figuring that'll get them to do something. So they had a control group and an experimental group, and over a three-year period, they measured, and sliced and diced all the data, and at the end of three years, in September 2010, they announced uh, that the two groups had exactly the same test score gains. Didn't make any, bonuses didn't make any difference. So I look at this and I say, well, I think that what this says to me is that both groups of teachers were teaching the best they knew how. They didn't know how to teach any better or any harder with or without the bonus. And it, it, it's just, there seem to be people thinking that there are some teachers who have this thing in the back of their head. I've got some really great lesson plans and I'm going to keep them in my hat. <laughs> and I'm not going to teach the kids the really good stuff unless somebody offers me a bonus. <laughs> and I'm just going to hold back. I'm going to stay in the classroom day after day hiding my good lesson plans until somebody offers a bonus. That's not happening. I mean, teaching is really, really hard. I mean, there, there have been now two major surveys in the last few years, the MetLife Survey of the American Teacher, and also uh, the Gates Foundation and Scholastic put together a survey 
and they both concurred that the average teacher works 11 hours a day. I mean, when you think about somebody spending 14 years to make $40,000 at a job where they're working 11 hours a day, dealing with other people's children with all kinds of problems, uh, this is not what you call a highly coveted job in our society. Uh, it's really hard work. People are not holding back. They're working their hearts out, and they're getting a lot of grief. New York City had a merit pay plan, but New York City, uh, Mayor Bloomberg decided instead of having the bonus go to individuals, it would go to the entire school. And then the school would decide how to separate the money. Hold on, because my cell phone's ringing. I think. Let me see if that's mine. Maybe it's yours. <laughs> it's not mine, it's yours. <laughs> um, so Mayor, Mayor Bloomberg's, self, uh, Mayor Bloomberg's uh, merit pay plan was that he would give bonuses to schools based on test score gains. And he did this for three years, and the Rand Corporation evaluated it. The city paid out $50 million in bonuses to schools, and the Rand Corporation evaluated and said, this was 50 million wasted dollars. It didn't make any difference. The schools, with and without the bonuses, got the same gains or not gains. It didn't matter. Chicago more recently tried merit pay for four years. It didn't work there either. It didn't work, and it didn't work, and it didn't work. How many times does it have to not work before people get it? It doesn't work. Uh, but the US Department of Education, soon after the Nashville results came out, and by soon I'm talking about a week after the Nashville report came out, saying that their plan showed that bonus pay didn't matter, announced that the federal government was setting aside a billion dollars for merit pay plans. Because people who have, this is faith-based policy, you have to understand. They're, they're, in education today, there is no evidence-based policy. We have faith-based policy. And so merit pay is strictly faith-based policy. So it's a billion dollars from the U.S. Department of Education to try again and again and again something that has never worked and will never work. Teachers don't want merit pay. They do not want to they do not want to compete with their colleagues to do the job. They want to cooperate and collaborate because they're working towards the same goal with the same children. That's why it doesn't work. What do teachers want? They want a decent living wage. They want to be treated with respect as professionals. They want to be. Uh, to have the autonomy to do their job, and they want to be evaluated by professionals and not by test scores. They want to be paid more for doing more, and they want to be paid more for having more education and more experience. When you say to teachers that you're not going to pay them for having a master's degree, you are sending a message that you really don't care about education. You don't want educated people teaching in your schools. Teachers, the first thing you would want of them is that they care about education that they want to learn, that they love learning, and that they want to be a model for their children of loving learning. And part of loving learning is that you go to school more, and you learn new things. You learn better ways to do what you're doing, and you get a master's degree in your subject because you want to be better at it for your kids. And now the state of North Carolina is, going to, is saying to its teachers, we're not going to pay you more just because you went to school and got a master's degree and devoted another year or two or three years of your life. That's, that's a bad message to send. So I know that it's, there's some, you don't yet have vouchers, but there's some in the state who'd like to have vouchers. And I'll just give you the bottom line on vouchers. They don't make a bean's worth of difference. They just siphon money out of the public school budget and uh, send kids off to some schools that are good, some schools that are bad, some schools that are religious, that uh, don't have the facilities or teachers or program or certified teachers or whatever. And, and the best example we have of the effect of vouchers is Milwaukee. Whenever you hear the word vouchers, think Milwaukee. It's the longest standing voucher program in the United States. Milwaukee adopted vouchers in 1990. That's 22 straight years of vouchers. They have now a vigorous voucher uh, sector as well as a charter sector. There are no differences in the test scores among the students who attend either vouchers, charters, or public schools. They all do the same. And they all do very badly. Uh, Milwaukee today is one of the lowest performing districts in the United States based on the federal testing, uh, the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Milwaukee ranks slightly above Detroit as one of the lowest performing cities in the country. And vouchers were sold in Milwaukee with the idea that they would save black kids from failing schools. Well, there are black kids in voucher schools, charter schools, and public schools. They're all doing badly and they're performing on on a, a, the same level 
as their peers in Mississippi. That doesn't say much for vouchers, does it? It just means that three competing sectors have been created. They're competing. There was no positive <coughs> result of competition amongst the schools, and uh, it's undermined support for public education because everybody's off into a different direction. What if the people of Milwaukee pulled their resources and got behind improving the education of kids in their public schools? <laughs> but there is yet another interesting twist in the voucher movement. And so much of this comes from an organization which you may or may not be familiar with called ALEC. ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, uh, has proposed vouchers for students with disabilities. And it sounds so benign, it sounds nice. Jeff Bush did it in Florida, it's called the McKay Scholarship Program. And it was exposed in a newspaper in Miami called the Miami Times, uh, Miami New Times. In 2011, the headline was, It's a Cottage Industry of Fraud and Chaos and Incompetence. Uh, this story about the McKay Scholarship Program for Kids with Disabilities won the Sigma Delta Chi Award, the, one of the highest awards in journalism, uh, for investigative reporting. Uh, the voucher schools in, uh, for kids with disabilities are completely unsupervised by the state. They don't have the staff to supervise them. There are no background checks for who opens the school. There are kids going to s school in basements and in shopping malls and in terrible facilities. Uh, there are poorly qualified people who've opened these schools. Some of them are criminals or have criminal records. Uh, some are religious, some are not. Some just want to get the money. Uh, some of them have no certified teachers. Some of them have no curriculum. The children are certainly not getting a better education. And there is some legal question about whether the kids even have the constitutional rights that they would have in a public school, or whether they check them at the door, particularly not only with vouchers, but with charters as well. So with the charter system, which I know that you have a lot of charter schools, and it's an idea that's spreading like wildfire. And my background, by the way, is that I served in the first Bush administration. I worked in several very conservative think tanks. And so I understand that when, when the voucher people realized that they could never ever get a voucher plan approved by the public, that there had been vote after vote in states, and every time the voucher came up for a vote, the public turned it down, uh, then my colleagues in the think tank said, well, charters are the way to go. It's the way to get the equivalent of a voucher. You get the money taken away from government and transferred to private hands, and we can even call them public schools, but they're not. The charters have introduced two new concepts in American education, and I'm a historian, so I can tell you this with some authority. We have never had for-profit schools, for-profit public schools in the United States until about 20 years ago. This idea that you would have, that, that people would create a corporation to make money from public schools. I mean, I can understand there are private schools that make money, but public schools where there are investors, where you're paying your tax dollars and some of it's going to pay off the investors, this is a brand new idea in American education. And it's a very bad idea because with the for-profit schools, their bottom line is always not the children, it's their investors, their stockholders, their shareholders. The second concept that the charters have brought to us, which I think is pernicious, is the idea of a chain school. Whoever heard of a chain school? I mean, we know about chain stores, we know about Target and Walmart and Starbucks and all of those other chains that are in every strip mall in the United States, but now we have chain schools. And we have charters that started in Arizona that are now spreading into Tennessee and you'll, have some, you'll, you'll get some charter from California. There are chain, chain store operation. It's something like the Walmartization of American education. So you lose something of your community when you have chain stores, chain schools chain store schools. What you have with charters is you have a deregulated sector. You have a sector that says we're not subject to state laws. It's an interesting question about whether they're actually public or private. I was telling Rob at breakfast this morning, or, um, or maybe it was Chris on his radio program, that uh, cha the charter schools have actually gone to court and claimed we are not public schools, we're private schools, because they don't want to be subject to state labor laws. And they have won rulings in the federal court and both and at the National Labor Relations Board saying you are a private corporation and a private school, you are not public. 
So the deal is that they're public for getting the money, but private for not obeying any of the laws uh, that have to do with either uh, the protection of student rights or, um, or labor laws. And so you have charter schools that are able to expel kids because of discipline issues, which they get, where do you think they go? <laughs> go back to the public school, and where the public school has to take them in. It's like, you know, that's the definition of family. When, when, when they kick you out, that's where you're always supposed to have a home. And public schools have to have their doors open to all kids. Charter schools do not. They get to select, they get to exclude, and some of the charters that have very high test scores get them by having very small proportions of students who are English language learners, very small proportions of kids with disabilities. In fact, they will choose the children with the mildest disabilities and exclude the children with the most severe disabilities. And then they say, we're doing, so. look at our scores, they're better than the public schools. Well, who do you think is getting the kids that have the most severe challenges? It's the public schools, so it's not even a fair comparison. But even despite this edge that the charters have, they're still not getting better test scores. In city after city, and in the few national studies that have been done, the public schools uh, and charter schools, there's very little difference in test scores, if that's what you care about. Um, and there have been many, many scandals. Massive financial irregularities, which is not surprising because they're deregulated. Deregulation brings with it uh, lots of autonomy, but also uh, the unscrupulous operators who uh, steal millions and millions from taxpayers. Now, people have said to me, there are certainly unscrupulous principles. The difference is they do not have an opportunity to steal millions of dollars. They can only steal petty cash. <laughs> With the charters, you get the uh, for-profit charters that get engaged in these very complex real estate deals, where at a certain point you realize the charter is a facade for the real estate deal. They're dealing in millions of dollars, and, and one of the biggest for-profit charter chains uh, is financed by a, a REIT, a real estate investment trust, whose major interest is entertainment. They own a lot of movie theaters and charter schools. Those are their two big investment areas. And then the federal government has tax break programs for people who construct charter schools where they can double their money in seven years. And the federal government is giving visas to foreigners who invest in charter school construction. I mean, there's all kinds of weird tax breaks going on that are just amazing, where uh, that's money that ought to be going into public education, but that's going to uh, these very canny entrepreneurs who figured out the, the, the tax breaks that are available. In Oregon, they're now, the state of Oregon is now pursuing some charter operators to try to reclaim $20 million. How do you get away with $20 million? They inflated their enrollment. They claimed kids that weren't even there. But the worst of all the charters are the virtual charters. And I'm happy, happy to say that uh, uh, North Carolina's school boards fought off the virtual charters. I think the uh, charter chain that was coming in here was K-12. It's the biggest in the country. And uh, K-12 has a pretty strong business operation, but a very poor academic operation. Uh, and uh, North Carolina Policy Watch and the good reporting that was done by North Carolina Policy Watch helped to at least bring the facts to the people of North Carolina that the uh, K-12 chain gets very poor results, very high attrition, in many of their charter schools or their virtual schools, the dropout rate is 50%. Test scores are very low. The graduation rates are outrageously low. And when the kids drop out, the money stays with the company. The kids go back to public school with no money attached to them. So it's a good business. The guy who is the, it's started by the Milken brothers. Remember Michael Milken, the Judd Pond King? He started K-12, he and his brother Lloyd. Uh, his brother Lloyd started a big merit pay program, which is still going. Um, and the CEO of the company has a background at McKinsey and Goldman Sachs. Uh, he makes $5 million a year. So it's, a, it's listed on the New York Stock Exchange and its stock price goes up and down depending on when there was, um, you know, like if the FBI is investigating them for inflating their enrollments, the stock price goes down a little, but then they go up again because some state, some state decides that they're going to allow them to operate and so their stock price goes up again. But it all depends on what was the latest story in either the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, what happened in the courts here in North Carolina. It affects the stock price of K-12. 
It's got nothing to do with education. This is all about money. It's not about children. It's about homeschooling with a computer where full tuition comes out of the budget of every district in the state of North Carolina to make money for the K-12 investors. Now, Pennsylvania is the uh, uh, homeland, or the, the really the, I don't know, the happy hunting grounds for the charter, uh, virtual charters. There are now 16 virtual charter corporations operating in Pennsylvania. The largest of them, which is a homegrown company, has 110,000 students, and with the reimbursement being what it is, they've taken about $100 million a year. <coughs> well, gosh, that's a lot of money for people where teachers are, you know, monitoring screens of 50 to 100 to 200 kids. Uh, they, they're not, they don't pay the teachers all that much. Uh, they have a lot of turnover among teachers, a lot of young teachers. Uh, the FBI just raided their offices a few months ago because they wanted to know where all that money was going and all these shell corporations here, here, there, and everywhere. I don't know. We're supposed to be talking about education. How do we get into this? Uh, very bad idea. So uh, I congratulate you for dodging that particular bullet. I hope you can continue to. What they do with the virtual charters is they'll, uh, as they did in North Carolina, pick out a very poor district, promise them um, a part of the action, and so this very poor district says, gosh, we'll get four or five million dollars a year for nothing. Uh, so they'll offer to be the sponsor, and then they'll make campaign contributions to the key people in the legislature, and next thing you know, they'll have a bill to legitimize them. So just keep your eyes open and watch that. Now, here's the problem with the business model for education and why education should not be run along business lines. The key thing in business, and I, I was recently listening to one of the major uh, equity managers to discuss this on CNN with Fareed Zakaria. He said that in a globalized world, the winner is the one who cuts costs the lowest. So where do you cut costs? You cut teachers. That's the biggest cost. So the goal then is to have larger classes, to have the least experienced teachers, because those people who hang around more than five years start wanting things like a pension, you know, to invest in a pension. You don't want to have to pay them a pension someday. So you want to have young teachers, a lot of turnover, and uh, large classes. And the holy grail right now is to find the technology that will make it possible to have one teacher to every hundred students. That would be really good because then you could fire a lot of your teachers and, and uh, just have people minding the technology. So that's the next, the next frontier for what's called, laughingly called reform, is to get rid of teachers. And one of the stories that you'll hear as you listen to the, um, these claims of the, the corporate reform types is, well, you know, if you have any doubt about the tremendous miracle of charters, just look to New Orleans. I mean, here's a city that's completely lost its public education system. It was replaced by a, a charter system where more than 80% of kids are in charters, and it's a miracle. Well, the only miracle there is public relations. New Orleans now has about 80% of its kids in charters, but 79% of its charters have been graded a D or an F by the state of Louisiana. Uh, it's a low-performing state, and Louisiana and New Orleans is about the lowest-performing district in that low-performing state. So when they talk to you about progress, they're saying, well, we're doing better than we were doing in 2005. Uh, but doing better doesn't mean they're doing well. It just means that they're still the lowest-performing district in a low-performing state, and that most of the choices are bad choices. Anywhere from two-thirds to 80% of the charter schools are actually not good schools. Now, if you look to this whole narrative of, uh, you know, they say our system is broken, that system is obsolete, what they don't tell you is that, this is, I have a new book coming out in the fall, I'm still debating the title with my editor, but at the moment the title is Hoax. And so <laughs> the hoax is, the, the, the lies we're being fed. Hoax number one is that our public schools are failing, our public schools are not failing. You might say that our society is failing, but our public schools are not failing. Mm -hmm. Our society is failing to take care of its children. Our society is failing to respect the people who are the caretakers of our children and the nurturers of our children and the educators of our children. And so we rely on high stakes testing as our measure of everything. And I'll tell you, to go back to what's the hoax, 
test scores in America today, and you can tell this to the next libertarian you run into, <laughs> test scores today are the highest in history for white kids, black kids, Hispanic kids, and Asian kids, the highest ever on National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is the only reliable measure there is. The graduation rates in America today are the highest they've ever been in history. The dropout rates are the lowest they've ever been in history. You, you won't hear this on the mainstream media. You'll hear it when Chris, uh, you hear Chris's interview if he keeps that part in. Uh, wherever Chris is, there he is. Uh, I mentioned that to him on the radio today. That's simply fact. All of that's in the U.S. Department of Education website. Test scores highest in history, graduation rates highest in history, dropout rates lowest in history. What about North Carolina? If you look at the NAEP scores, we've made tremendous progress in fourth grade reading. Scores in eighth grade reading are pretty flat. I'm talking about over a 20, 20 year period. Phenomenal progress in fourth grade math and phenomenal progress in eighth grade math. At the same time, about half the kids in the state live in poverty. I think it's remarkable to make any progress when half the kids in the state live in poverty. <laughs> Because here's the deal about testing. Tests are a measure of socioeconomic status. The well-to-do kids overpopulate the top half of the distribution, and the poor kids overpopulate the bottom half of the distribution. It's not because the, the well-to-do kids are smarter, but because they have so many advantages in life, and because the poor kids have so many obstacles in life. And the tests reflect that. They, they reflect the fact that one group of kids has educated parents, good home, a safe neighborhood, uh, a com home computer, books in the home, book, more vocabulary spoken. All of these pr privileges help test scores. But the test scores today are being treated as though there's some sort of a scientific measure. They are not. The tests are not a barometer. They're not a yardstick. They're not a thermometer, they're a, they're a cultural product. Many countries don't even use standardized tests. We, we invented them. <coughs> we invented them and originally they were called an IQ test. And the tests that we have today are uh, the uh, legacy of the IQ testing movement. And that is that they're normed on a bell curve. And it's the, we, we hear the, you know, the people who say that they're reformers say we want to close the achievement gap. Tests don't close the achievement gap, tests measure the achievement gap. That the achievement gap never closes because it's normed on a bell curve, and a bell curve never closes. A bell curve always has a bottom half and a top half. Huh. Poverty is the most reliable predictor of low test scores, and that's true on every standardized <coughs> test. It's true on the ACT, the SAT, uh, the NAEP, uh, or the international test, and it's true around the world where there's poverty, there's low scores, and there is a gap, and in fact, the gap in this country is much smaller than, than it is in many countries around the world. The free market does not help the most vulnerable children. The free market does not produce equality of educational opportunity. It's in the nature of the free market, that's why we have the stock market. It's to pick winners and losers. When you pick winners and losers, some of your stocks do well, some of them do poorly, you keep the good ones and you sell off the bad ones. You apply that same principle to school, you keep the kids with high scores, you kick out the kids with low scores. Where do they go? You know where they'll go. They're going, they will go to where we are heading now, which is to create, to recreate, and to reestablish a dual school system. So what we do if we pursue this privatization of, and using markets for charters and vouchers, is to destroy neighborhood schools. It will just totally wipe out rural communities. I don't understand why any legislator from a rural community or a small town would support charters and vouchers because it will destroy their community school. And if you only have one school in your town, why would you want to open another one? You destroy your community, you shatter the community. What it does in a town like a city like Chicago is they're opening schools, they're closing schools, they're opening the Kids are crossing gang territory. The murder rate amongst youth is astonishing. It's terrifying. And most of the critics of the school closings say that it has caused this dramatic increase in youth violence. So my conclusion is that this state 
like others, you're not alone, unfortunately, is on the wrong track. You're on the road to dismantling public education, to destroying the teaching profession, and to ruining education in the state for generations to come, and calling it reform. I don't know, I know what offends me more, but I'm so offended by the idea that this is called something that is for civil rights. It is not for civil rights. Taking away the public sector does not advance civil rights. Public education matters. Public education was the mechanism for the desegregation, not only of our schools, but our society. Public education was the mechanism for gender equity, not only for our schools, but for our society. And public education was the mechanism for the inclusion of people with disabilities and the respect for people with disabilities. That could not have happened if our schools were privatized. So it's not too late. It may seem like it's too late. You can turn back. You can change your vision, and you must stop those who claim that our public schools are broken. They're not. Their vision is wrong. You should be focused on providing early childhood for all children, which is something that North Carolina once valued. You should insist that every school have a strong curriculum, and that the arts and history and civics and physical education, all of that is present for all the children. You should demand that every school has the resources it needs, a school nurse, a psychologist, librarian, counselors, the help that kids need. You should make sure that every school has the after-school programs so the children have worthwhile things to do, the sports, the robotics, the chess, the 4-H, whatever positive activities kids want to engage in where they're able to do the things that are fun to do and not just do test prep all the time. You should have reasonable class sizes. This idea that a great teacher is a great teacher, whether she has 24 or 48 kids in her class, is insane. Someone who's a spectacular teacher with 24 kids will simply be overwhelmed if class size doubles, as some people think. The research is overwhelming that small classes are especially beneficial to minority children in the early grades. And if we increase class sizes for those children, they will be harmed for many years to come. We should, of course, encourage parents to be deeply involved in the decisions about their children. I would love to see it, the day come when we abandon high-stakes testing altogether and develop assessments that allow kids to demonstrate what they know through projects and essays and other means. I sincerely have come to believe that if you spend 12 years guessing the right bubble, it will not make our society better. We will be crushing creativity, crushing risk-taking, punishing children who think outside the box, and punishing those who think deeply. And that's not what we want. So I encourage you to treat teachers with the respect they deserve, recognize that public education is the cornerstone, cornerstone of our democracy, and join with your neighbors, join with your friends, join with whatever groups there are in your community and in your state to support public education and to turn around this terrible movement to destroy education and call it reform. Thank you. If only Ms. Ravitch would speak her mind. Uh, we have a couple second, a couple minutes for questions. She actually does have to catch a plane, but Rob has a, a wireless microphone, so if you raise your hand, please, and identify yourself, and please ask really brief questions so we can uh, have as many folks have a chance. Thank you. I'll go to you, Bob. Thank you. Um, I wonder, Diane, if I'm honored to be here to be able to ask you a question, but do you have the reason why the media has treated these scandals so lightly? Uh, the one in Atlanta a few years ago got a lot of publicity. I thought two years ago, finally, Michelle Reedy is being called on the carpet. Very, very quickly, she, every year, she would call her principals in in June and demand a 10% increase over the previous year. Blue High School, which I'm familiar with, it was impossible. So the incentive is there for the administrator to cheat on the test. But I guess my question is why you think the media, it's very lightly, it's a one-day story.
Well, it's quite amazing that the media has not pursued any of this. Uh, Michelle Rhee actually didn't see any test score gains in, in her, on her watch in D.C. Uh, there were gains before she got there, and the gains continued when she first started. But when she put her whole reform program into place, all the gains stopped and went flat. And then they had the massive cheating scandal, which was in USA Today, and it got whitewashed. And uh, it, it's, I have this new book coming out, as I mentioned, I have a chapter called The Mystery of Michelle Reed. <laughs> Frankly, the mystery is why she continues to get all the media attention, and I, I, I don't know. It's a, some some PR um, you know, genius would have to explain to me how does this happen that someone who actually has no track record in terms of producing good education could then produce a report card grading the states and saying you're good or bad if you met her criteria. I mean, this is so ridiculous. How did she become the criteria maker for education quality in the United States? In fact, the D District of Columbia Public Schools has the largest achievement gap between blacks and whites and Hispanic and whites of any school district tested by the NAEP. And there's some 22 major urban districts. The achievement gap is so large in D.C. that it's double the size of any other urban district. It's huge. And then she goes around telling people come, that they have an achievement gap. She should be an expert on it, but she doesn't know how to close it. So it is, it is quite puzzling. I've never understood it. And I noticed that as she was going around promoting her new book, um, only one of the interviewers even asked for hard questions, and that was Bill Mayer. And I always figured that the ones who asked the hard questions have either a sister or a mother or a, someone in their family who was a teacher. Here's another question from Donnie. Hi, Diane. Um, I have a question about how you feel the Gates Foundation fits in in all this. <laughs> well, it, it's, the Gates Foundation is funding most of the really bad ideas, uh, like this evaluating teachers by test scores. Uh, you know, the Gates Foundation had, for a while, their, their fixed idea was that small schools were the answer to everything. And I think small schools are good. You know, I have nothing against small schools. And, the problem is that there were some high schools or large schools who were actually doing a good job in my city that got broken up, or high schools where they had programs for ELLs and, and programs that met the needs of the kids, where once they broke them into small schools, no one wanted the ELLs. And they, they're now being, they're closing school after school. Even some of the new small schools are being closed because they didn't work. So we're playing this game of moving the kids around like uh, checker pieces. Uh, but the Gates Foundation, change from small schools to teacher evaluation. And they make the most ludicrous statements. Uh, Melinda Gates was on PBS one night, which is funded by the Gates Foundation. <laughs> the, the, literally, the program was funded by the Gates Foundation. And she said, um, we've now figured out that the system is broken, and we're going to, we now realize we can have a great teacher in every classroom. Well, how do you have a great teacher in every classroom where you're demoralizing every teacher in the United States? I mean, the, the, what the, their own survey, no, it was the MetLife survey of the American teachers said that demoralization among teachers and principals is at one of the highest points ever, and that a third of teachers are thinking of quitting. A third, that's a million people. Teacher America only produces five or six or 7,000 teachers every year, and they're gone after two years. So where are all the new teachers going to come from? Why will great teachers come into a profession that is so demoralized and so demonized? And Gates has had a large part in that. They've also had a large part in undercutting the unions uh, while claiming to be friends. Uh, they've created uh, fake groups like, with names like Teach Plus and Educators for Excellence uh, that go before the legislature and say, we're teachers, we don't want tenure, we don't want this, we don't want that, please take everything away from us. <laughs> this is not the view of the teachers, but it's the view of these young kids to whom they've given a couple million dollars to go in and undercut teachers. Uh, so I think that uh, They've played a very big role in the charter movement. They've played a very big role in this uh, promotion of the idea that test scores are a way of evaluating teachers. And uh, I just think that I'd like to see them take on a district, one district, and say, this is our district, we own this district, and show the nation what you can do. Mm -hmm. And but by the way, they, own, they bought and, and, and uh, underwrote the Common Core Standards at every point. They, they paid for the development, they paid for the evaluation, they're paying for, for uh, their doing, I don't know, all sorts of stuff. The other thing they're involved in, and this is going to happen, I think, this week in, in Charlotte, or maybe it's Raleigh-Durham, is that uh, there's a big meeting of something called In Bloom. 
you should be aware of this. And Bloom is a Gates-funded operation where Gates and Rupert Murdoch are collaborating, and states and districts are giving the, this collaboration all the confidential data about their students so that they will have the, the names, the addresses, the social security numbers, the grades, the test scores, the disability status, and about 50 others, every indicator they have to put into a database which will somehow be managed by Amazon.com <laughs> and Rupert Murdoch and available to the marketers. So welcome to the, the brave new world of who owns your students' data. Okay. Diane, I've got a question back here, but I want you to say the name of the group that you're starting at the national level. I don't think that's been mentioned today. Yeah, well, you know, in the, in the pushback, I, you know, I don't want to leave you all uh, feeling utterly depressed about how terrible things are. <laughs> I want you to know that there is a lot of pushback around the country. There are grassroots groups, grassroots groups starting up in many, many cities and states, and uh, the bloggers, the education bloggers, are tremendous. So I decided a couple of weeks ago with several friends across the country that to start a group called the Network for Public Education, and I urge you to Google it, uh, see see what our principles are. Join it if you want to. The membership is twenty dollars. For students, it's five dollars. Uh, what we try to do through this uh, network is not to take over anything, but to, but to contact all the grassroots groups, put their websites, connect links to everyone's websites, so that everybody can be in touch with everybody. The reason for this is that there have been there were a number of elections last fall where the millionaires and the billionaires and the multimillionaires got together and put money into local school board races and state school board races and have taken over state school boards and local school boards simply by money. Uh, and we realized we can never match money, but we have numbers. And so we have to use social media to contact people who care about public education and, and saving uh, what we have and, and rebuilding and strengthening public education by social media. So. This, in effect, worked in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago. There was a big election, and the, the, the super wealthy poured in about $4 million to be one guy. And this one guy was on the school board of Los Angeles. And he, he had started education as a Teach for America teacher, but then stayed for 17 years to teach in the Los Angeles public schools. And he ran for school board, and he's a very independent-minded guy, and sometimes votes with her on, on either side. He's, but he made a huge mistake. He made a mistake of saying that, you know, Los Angeles has now um, got more charter schools than any, any other city in the country, and we have no plan to oversee the charters. We have no accountability for charters. And he proposed to the school board that there should be a moratorium on new charters until they had a plan to oversee them. And for this grave offense, he was targeted by the charter lobby for defeat, and they raised uh, between, somewhere between four and five million dollars to beat him. And uh, he won 52 to 48. It was very close, but he won. And of course, the LA Times endorsed his opponent. They said that he was far, far and away the better candidate, but they endorsed his opponent anyway. And I said, you know, they should, he should use that in the endorsement of his opponent and his ads because he, they said such nice things about him, about how he was thoughtful, he was independent. But they decided that because the union was supporting him, they couldn't support him. Well, the union was supporting him because they didn't want the billionaires to buy, to buy their own candidate. Uh, so it's, we can't match their money, but we, I figure this, we are many and they are few. They may have a lot of money, but we have a lot of people. So I would urge you to get involved with uh, some of the statewide groups in North Carolina, like public education first. Public schools first. Public schools first. Public schools first, NC, right? Yes. And then there's, in, in Charlotte Mecklenburg, there's Mecklenburg Acts, which yes. are some fabulous parents who are fighting high stakes testing. And you know what, if you take away the high stakes testing, a lot of this collapses. Because um, if, if you are using standardized testing, uh, and you realize that half the kids are always going to be below the median, right? So that's used against the public schools. You don't have everybody on top of the bell curve. Sorry, guys, it never works that way. It's a statistical <laughs> artifact. <laughs> um, but I, I, do, I, I take hope in the fact that, that for their students organizing. Uh, the Providence Student Union of Providence, Rhode Island is very uh, inspiring to me. And I have a blog, which I hope you'll all sign on to and read. And, and you better care a lot about education or you'll have to unsubscribe <laughs> because you'll get overwhelmed. It's dianeravish.net. And I've, and since last April, had three and a half million page views. So it gives you some idea of 
the amount of information pouring in from all over the country, uh, some of which is good and some of which is bad. The best news this week was from Providence, where the Providence High School students said, the, the State Department of Education, Rhode Island, wants to take a standardized test and used it as the graduation test. Half the kids are going to fail the test. And we know who the half will be. They'll be the kids with disabilities. They'll be the English language learners. They'll be the minority students who don't have the opportunities to, uh, to meet these demands. But we can't all be in the top half. It's not going to work. And so they held, first of all, they held a zombie protest in front of the state education. And they all splattered themselves with ketchup. That didn't go very far. So last, last Saturday, they in, in found 50 accomplished professionals to take the test. And they created a test made up of released items in mathematics. And they got 50 people who were lawyers and legislators and professionals in different fields who took the test. And 60% of them failed it. <laughs> and that made national news. And the state superintendent said, this is ridiculous. You're not a psychometrician, but neither is she. Uh, and any psychometrician would have told her, you don't use a standardized test for a high school graduation requirement. But you know, when kids do things like this, it gives me tremendous heart. Like the students in Portland, Oregon are boycotting the state test. Uh, the teachers of uh, Garfield High School in Seattle are, are boycotting the next test that's being foisted on them. So 80% of the school boards in the state of Texas have passed resolutions against high state testing. But it takes more than passing resolutions. It takes opting out. It takes people to say no. It takes legislators who will ask the tough questions. Um, I could go on and on with the stories because they're all over the country where parents are standing up and fighting, teachers are standing up and saying, no, you can't do it alone. You have to do it in groups. If you, if, parents can do it alone, but you shouldn't do it alone. Uh, you're, they only listen to you when they see numbers of people saying, I'm mad as hell and I'm not, not going to take it anymore. <laughs> I want to fight for public education. Thank you so much. Uh -huh.